In this fifth video on Combat Mission Tactics, I will show how to conduct a defense using Combat Mission Commonwealth Forces. In this scenario, a weak German company supported by a platoon of light anti-tank guns and a mortar section are in hasty defensive positions awaiting a British attack. A study of the briefing indicates that the British will be attacking with a strong force supported by abundant artillery. The Germans have had little time to prepare the battlefield. A few mines have been placed at key locations, such as road junctions, and some foxholes have been dug. In order to set up a successful defense, you must be thoroughly familiar with the terrain. As usual, I start my planning using a coca. Specifically, you begin by imagining how the enemy will attack and then you design a defense to prevent them from penetrating your positions and seizing the objective. My thought process goes like this. The hedgerows running perpendicular to the British axis of advance are the dominant feature of this battlefield because they restrict the British tank's ability to maneuver. The British armor must cross a large open area to get to the objective areas. The configuration of the lines of hedgerows and the woods on the right will allow the Germans to fire into this open area, setting up a potential armored kill zone. The attacker probably realizes this and will try to clear the way with infantry supported by tanks and indirect fire. Since the British will probably have tank and indirect fire support, it is important to keep our infantry from being destroyed by long-range fires before we can engage the British infantry. Therefore, we do not want to position our defense too far forward where they can be easily engaged by the British supporting fires. The leading edge of our defense will be an outpost line whose primary purpose is to observe the advancing British. The main line of defense will be set up further back where it will be difficult for the British to fire upon us without bringing their tanks into our prepared kill zones. This will force the British to engage our infantry with their infantry in situations where we will be able to catch them by surprise and achieve instant fire superiority. In this way, we set up our defense with some depth. The depth allows us to do several things. First, we avoid having our defense engaged all at once. Second, our outpost line will allow us to identify the main axis of the enemy attack. Third, the depth allows us to keep some of our forces unengaged so we can maneuver them to critical points at the proper time and seize the initiative back from the enemy. Keeping these points in mind, I deploy my forces as follows. As usual, I deploy my heavy weapons first. The anti-tank guns are deployed to cover the road in the center and the adjoining field. I set up two anti-tank guns in positions behind the line of hedgerows that run across the middle of the map so they cannot be observed by the British until the British have penetrated the hedgerow line. A third anti-tank gun can fire diagonally into the center of the map but cannot be seen until the enemy comes into the open. I also position a mortar team and a machine gun team with the two NA tank guns to support them. All these heavy weapons are positioned to mutually support one another with crossing fire setting up a kill zone in the middle of the map. Regarding indirect fire planning, since there are no target reference points, which are essential to quickly and accurately targeting your mortars using indirect fire, I decide to employ my two mortar teams in the direct fire role to make the best use of the mortar team's limited ammunition supply, I position them in the back of my defense in places where they can lob shells effectively at key target areas to their front. I then position the two infantry platoons to defend the hedgerows running across the middle of the battlefield from the advancing British infantry. One platoon, the first platoon, is positioned on the right in the woods but not on the forward edge where they can be pounded by British heavy weapons. I stick only a couple teams on the edge to, do, to observe. Most of the men are placed further back where they can cover the gaps in the hedgerows with machine guns. In the center and on the left, I spread out the second platoon. 
Again, I keep them back from the edge of the hedgerow. I place only two teams forward to watch the enemy, along with the mortar platoon leader, who I place in the second floor of a house where he can observe the open fields to the front. The only heavy weapon I placed forward is a single mortar team. This team is placed so it is hidden from enemy view by a house, but can fire obliquely into the open fields. Finally, I place all my Panzer Shrek equipped anti-tank teams behind my infantry. I will move them up as necessary once I figure out where the enemy is attacking in strength. Before I finish my setup, I hide all my men except the scout teams in the outpost zone. I want them to be searching for the enemy. The battle begins. The first seven minutes pass without contact with the enemy. Then the British are spotted sneaking up on the right and are fired upon by my scout team. As soon as the scout team engages the enemy, I have them move to new positions to make it difficult for the enemy to mass area fire. I move the first platoon leader forward to ensure that the scout team is under control. Initially, I had kept the platoon leader back in case the British opened the battle with a barrage. But as my men engage the enemy, I want to make sure that all the teams are under the control of their leaders. Over the next 10 minutes, my scouts in the outpost line watch as the British infantry cautiously moves forward across the front. Then the first British tank is spotted. I am playing a human opponent in this battle and he's leery of being caught in a well-crafted German kill zone. British troops open up on the scout teams and mortar fire begins to fall in the center. The British are now close to the woods on the right and I move a team forward to cover the gap in the hedgerow where they can enter the woods. The British press forward in the center and then make a run for the woods. I engage them with the mortar team on the left but their fire misses. I decide they are ineffective and pull them back before they are engaged by heavy British weapons. My anti-tank gun opens up on the British in the center since the enemy is now close enough to potentially spot my position. All along the front, the British are pressing me with small arms and mortar fire. It's time to pull back the outpost line. My scouts have learned that the enemy is attacking on a wide front with infantry in the lead and tanks behind in support. 20 minutes have passed. I receive two martyrs as reinforcements. Armored vehicles without turrets should fight from stationary positions, so I move them where they can support my anti-tank guns from the rear of my line. One to the right and one crossing over to the left. They are in position before the enemy closes on my main line of defense. On the right, in the woods, my troops fight from inside the woods using area fire on the gaps in the hedgerow surrounding the woods to keep the British infantry at bay. Assessing the situation, based upon the knowledge I have gained from my scouts in the outpost line, I conclude that the first platoon's position on the right is strong enough to hold the woods. The road in the open area in the center is well covered by my heavy weapons, but there is a threat to my left by the advancing British infantry. If they breach my line at that point, they will be able to attack my heavy weapons from the flank. I decide to shift the entire second platoon to the left to prevent the British infantry from penetrating the double line of hedgerows on either side of the lane running across my front. As my troops shift positions, there's a break in contact with the enemy. Five minutes later, all my troops are in their new positions. The enemy begins to shell the left side of the hedgerow line running across my front. I move my troops back to prevent unnecessary casualties. On the right, they shell the edge of the woods. The British attack on my positions should start shortly. I wait. The shelling stops on the left, and I move the second platoon forward to the hedgerow line to meet the British attack. On the right, my men, positioned to back, use area fire 
to stop the room. On the left, the second platoon gains the hedgerow and fires from the advanced British infantry. The supporting British tanks take the hedgerow under fire, and again, I have the second platoon move back to the hedgerow line. I do not want to stand and fight in a situation where I do not have fire superiority. On the right, the British mortar fire begins to cause casualties. The British have blown a gap in the hedgerow and moved a tank into the woods. My men back away from the tank towards the rear of the woods. As I withdraw on the right and left, there's another break in contact with the enemy. Again, I anticipate that the British infantry are moving up towards the hedgerow on the left, and I send the second platoon forward to counterattack once more. As they advance towards the enemy, I split my troops into teams and move them in short rushes, each team covering the other. This time, they are supported by my mortar team using direct fire. They catch the British infantry as they move towards the hedgerow on the other side of the lane and fire upon them inflicting casualties. The enemy run in fear of their lives. The British counter the tank fire, and again, I withdraw my men. In the center, our British tank moves up to engage my anti-tank gun. In a duel, they knock each other out. On the right, the British tank moves forward through the woods without infantry support. I see a rare chance and attack the tank with grenades, knocking it out. Nonetheless, the British continue pushing forward, making towards the exit from the woods, avoiding the first platoon, now hunkered down in the right corner of the woods. I move a Panzerschreck team into position to cover the exit from the woods. Back on the left, the second platoon counterattacks towards the hedgerow for a third time, catching the British yet again. This time, the British pull off and move away. Simultaneously, British infantry occupy the buildings in the center by the road. This is my kill zone, and I pound them with fire from a Panzerschreck team and a martyr. Unless the British can dislodge my positions on the flanks, their troops in the center won't stand a chance of advancing without heavy casualties. Time has nearly run out. A British tank with supporting infantry tries to attack out of the exit from the woods by the road. The tank is hit repeatedly by Panzerschreck fire. While I attack the infantry with my mortar team positioned to cover the exit with direct fire, the Panzerschreck operator is killed by a British officer. As the game comes to an end, we have stopped the British attack. Despite having considerable firepower, the British were never able to bring their combat power to bear. We had a good plan based on careful analysis of the terrain. We used defense in depth, allowing us to shift our forces to cover vulnerable points during the battle. Through the use of repeated counterattacks, we blocked all attempts to unravel our defensive scheme. The enemy, for the most part, avoided our main kill zone, but as a result was unable to take their objective in the time allotted, while we inflicted twice as many casualties as we received. Throughout the battle, we never surrendered our freedom of action, and as a result of winning numerous small firefights, emerged victorious. Until next time, this is Jeffrey Paulding of Armchair General, signing off.